All right. Well, I don't know about uh, all of you guys what your background is, but as a state senator, to understand some of that and understand the math, I know that uh, I have become somewhat of a uh, global warming fanatic because I did understand the mathematical equations and things, and uh, it was it's exciting to to understand enough, but then turn it over to tell our constituents um, as elected people. Our next speaker is Jan Weisner from, uh, um, well, I have a head cold, so excuse me for not being able to do this very well today. He's a distinguished university professor of geology at the University of Ottawa, emeritus since April 2004, where he held the NSERC, Noranda CIAR Research Chair in Earth Systems, uh, from 1992 to 2004 concurrently and served as director of the Earth System Evolution Program of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. So all of our speakers have exhaustive uh, bios in our book, but uh, we'll get right to Jan. Thanks. What you, what you are seeing here is a famous clock in Prague. And, um, I personally, I was in the army in Prague in the 60s, but that's not the reason why I'm showing it. But uh, it's a kind of an analogy. I'm a geologist, how I see the, how the Earth works. It's a maze of wheels. Of course, in geology, we call them cycles. Cycles of water, cycles of uh, uh, carbon, uh, water, uh, life cycle, mountain cycle, and so on. They will operate on different times and space scales. Well, uh, I will not be able to do in the time constraints to do anything except coupling of water and carbon cycle. I, for that reason, I wrote this stuff uh, on, a, on a three, four pages, and it's uh, up on, at the end, so you can pick it up uh, and uh, read uh, more on the subject. I'm not, uh, please don't put it on, on the uh, web at this stage, because for the first time, there may be a newspaper publishing it, so I don't want them to any excuse not to publish it. Uh, and, uh, be, uh, so, uh, the, when we are talking about greenhouse, of course, uh, you know that it would be about minus 18 uh, if, if we didn't have the atmosphere, so we have about 30 degrees natural, 33 degrees natural greenhouse. Uh, the anthropogenic is, so-called so anthropogenic, is about 0.6 or so. The point of that is that actually most of that greenhouse, uh, at least two thirds and can be much more, is really due to the water vapor. And uh, so water vapor is by far the most important greenhouse gas. That's nothing new. But if you actually, if this is the case, so input of energy into water cycle from any source would generate more water vapor, therefore it will be warmer and wetter climate. So, uh, as you know, well, you have to support big U.S. banks and not uh, Iceland, because it doesn't matter what Iceland does, but if uh, U.S. banks collapse, you would have a big disaster. So the climate debate is reality not about carbon dioxide, but about the poor, poorly no planetary energy balance. So from uh, this, uh, what uh, satellites were showing or saying that, okay, sun couldn't do it because the variation in total solar uh, irradiance is very small, 0.1 watts or something like that. So therefore, there is some kind of a discrepancy of 1.6 watts per square meter or something like that in the total balance of about, or, or, or this, well, average balance or, or, or in, input on the surface of the atmosphere. And this is mostly due to greenhouse gases and other, well, uh, other possible uh, sources. Well, okay. So the, the essentially the structure of the model is that there is a prescribed CO2 and this is it's essentially energy which is being put up into the system and then water, uh, we have a water cycle which is doing the business as you heard before, this is the positive water vapor feedback and that generates climate. So we are driving essentially the system from the bottom up from the tail to, uh, uh, using the tail to drive the, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, push the, the dog. Well, I'm going to argue that this is not simple, and the water is not just there, just to turn around and respond. This would be like arguing that, uh, for example, the European economy is being driven by, uh, by Luxembourg. Well, Luxembourg cannot do it, but you know Germany just sit there, and when they export or import something, then Germany starts rolling up, and on behalf of, the, of Luxembourg is uh, generating European climate, uh, European uh, economy. Well, those things are coupled and complexly coupled, and water is really a very important factor involved. 
So uh, the question is, so uh, because of this structure of the model, the carbon cycle is therefore a driver of this climate because it's driving the water cycle in Fulish. Or is it so, or is it the other way around? I personally started working on this when I was looking for the, uh, some 10, 15 years ago, I started to look, over there was so-called missing carbon sink, and I wanted to, and it was supposed to be in the boreal forest in Canada, so I wanted to get the credits for Canada. And uh, I changed my mind. At that stage, I, I believed everything, what I was told. Well, uh, this is the uh, uh, CO2, which you are seeing here, is uh, from, uh, from the southern to the northern hemisphere. The CO2 increases, and as we go with time, it increases. Part of it, of course, is at least part of it, or probably most of it is anthropogenic. And there are big variations. So you see that, the most, uh, that uh, uh, most of the CO2 variability is concentrated on the northern hemisphere. Uh, why? Because uh, the, uh, at least on the time scales of years or, or decades, so the controlling fluxes are really on land. So uh, what is the uh, real, um, uh, what is the, the budget of the carbon dioxide? Well, we have about 730 uh, units of this size in the atmosphere of carbon, and about 120 of those units are going up through photosynthesis and respiration back and forth in biology on the Earth. Lots of it also similar in the oceans, and lots of it is photosynthesis as well. So it's, uh, and uh, compared to that, uh, the anthropogenic is something like 5% or less. So you see actually you drive through on land uh, the equivalent of the entire atmospheric carbon in roughly every five years, okay? So uh, how is it however done? Well, what is driving this process of photosynthesis? Well, let's look at the uh, jungle where we have the most of the photosynthesis. And there, uh, for, for example, in the Amazon. So what you are seeing there on the bottom, these are uh, uh, wet period and cold and uh, dry period. And essentially, you see that most of the, in, in the dry period, uh, this is when you have most of the sun, uh, because simply you don't have clouds. So, and at the same time, you have the increasing leaf index, that means you increase the photosynthesis. So biggest photosynthesis is when you have most of the sun. <coughs> It is photosynthesis, it's driven by photons. The energy absolutely necessary for it, okay? Then when you look at the, uh, however, when you do photosynthesis, that plant, okay, it takes, we are supposed to plant the trees. Yes, true, but that plant will take one CO2. But for every CO2, that plant has to transpire back into the atmosphere, uh, the, uh, what's, what happened? Something happened here. I cannot move it. What? Escape? Okay. Okay. Uh, is it? Okay. And this is this is a huge process. The uh, the process which is involved in evaporation, transpiration, and then raining is 78 watts. And we were arguing about 1.6 watts. Okay. So 78 watts up or down on average. And what is this, uh, what, uh, so this is the loop. And from those, uh, so this is a huge amount of energy. In fact, if you put up the number of watts which is involved in photosynthesis, it would be a number with 14 zeros afterwards, globally. So if you, uh, then, uh, if you look at it, so how, uh, how is this achieved? Well, of course, it's done by sun. The energy is coming from the sun. But that plant, for we were supposed to plant, uh, plant the trees to lower the CO2, but for every one single CO2, that plant has to transpire back almost 1,000 molecules of water, and that has to go back into the atmosphere. 1,000 to 1 ratio. Who is pushing who? And that reaction, why is it needed? And it's salt water, it's not from rain. And uh, why is it needed? Because uh, the actual uh, photosynthesis is one water, one CO2. Okay, so most of the energy is really needed to drive the water through. Why do you need it? Because you need to bring the nutrients to the plant. So 19, 999 of those water molecules has to go up to the atmosphere, okay? So you have, there are both things being driven by energy of the sun, photosynthesis, okay? So if this is so, then 
you look at the, uh, the amount of, if you want, want uh, the sequestration capacity of different ecosystems, the amount of net primary productivity. And what you are seeing here is our actual measurements. Then you are in the tropics. So when you uh, look at the blue one, then it's kind of a plateau. Why is it at the plateau? Uh, because the system works at the efficiency of the system with respect to for solar radiation, photosynthesis, it's 6%, okay? And if you want more photosynthesis, you need more sun. You cannot go any higher. It has nothing to do with CO2, okay? And the whole thing has nothing to do with CO2 because as you go to, towards higher latitudes, then what you are seeing that the dependency is the, what is limiting is, is the amount of water, okay? And I explain how it works out afterwards. But so, uh, the, uh, so the question then comes up. If this is so, if the water is so important, then what we, if we could somehow limit the amount of water involved in photosynthesis, if you wish, and respiration, then we should get a similar amount of, uh, similar pattern for water involved in biology, which would be exactly the same shape, only 1,000 times bigger. Clear? So we decided to work on, on, uh, on uh, uh, river systems, big river systems. Why? Because for uh, you, uh, it's a relatively close system. Your precipitation, you can essentially take it from the web. There are data on precipitation for, for a basin. The amount of water flowing out, discharges are well known also for about 100 years. So precipitation minus discharge is evapotranspiration. Now the problem, of course, is to divide evaporation and transpiration, and usually that's a very big problem. But uh, uh, we worked out the uh, isotope systematics and did quite a number of those basins, and this systematics is based on, we've done a lot of the other things, but based on hydrogen and oxygen isotopes, and essentially what you get is uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, precipitation goes along the steeper line, which is LM, so-called uh, local meteoric water line, which is a steeper line. So when you plot oxygen and, uh, and uh, hydrogen isotopes against each other, when it's uh, in warmer times, it's up there, in colder times, it's down there. And you always will line uh, this line. If there is no evaporation, then water, which will be coming out from that uh, system uh, uh, by discharge from, from the river system, will line on exactly the same lines. But if there is a physical evaporation, because hydrogen one is lighter than hydrogen two, oxygen 16 is lighter than oxygen 18, they evaporate somewhat faster. Therefore, there will be a deviation towards the right, and the more evaporation, the more it will deviate. And therefore, you can calculate it. So I show you two examples. One ex uh, of the basins which we study are these. So this is from, from all the way from northern ecosystems through Africa to, to Papua <coughs> New Guinea. It's about 15 ecosystems, it's about 15 years of work, and uh, every one of those systems is a two or three years of work, and it's PhD or postdoc. So it's lots of work. So uh, the, if you, I'll show you now one example from the water-limited system, and another example from the uh, tropics. So in the water-limited system, like the uh, North Saskatchewan or South Saskatchewan River, so what you are seeing here, again, the precipitation which was measured, you see that line, and then uh, the water which was coming out of the system at the end, uh, the discharge of the river, is deviating, see? So there is evaporation. So when you do the actual calculation, what you find out, that from the, there is a precipitation of about half a meter, and from that precipitation, about 20% is discharged from the, from the river system away, flows into the sea. Uh, about 25% uh, it's uh, evaporation either from canopy or from the surface, and half of that water goes back by plants. This is a huge amount of water, huge amount of energy. This is, most of the water is just recirculated water via biology. If you go on the, on the tropics, like Papua New Guinea, fly river system, what you are seeing there is, again, you see the precipitation which was measured, but here the water flowing out of the system it's almost on the line, okay? So the precipitation relatively is very small, okay? And, but relatively, percentage-wise, it's still a big number because there the rain is eight meters, okay? 
But from the date meters, 90% flows out of the system. You don't need it because the system cannot operate any in a higher efficiency than the sun. Okay, and the rest, the, uh, the uh, uh, evaporation is about 20% and the actual transpiration is only about 10% of the water, but it's still one meter, okay? So when you put up the amount of which is involved, therefore, of water, precipitation versus involved in, in uh, uh, transpiration in every one of those basins, here, every point is a one of those basins, and it's exactly the same pattern, both limited uh, and then uh, uh, or solar limited. Those two points are way up there. Okay? So, and it's 1,000 to 1. And this was calculated on water. It has nothing to do with carbon. Okay? So those two things go together. You cannot have one without the other. Okay? So, so how does it work? When the sun is stronger, what happens? Your level of photosynthesis rises up. At the same time, you have more evaporation, okay, and more water vapor. It's warmer. You have more water being transported into the high latitudes, therefore more rain, more warmer, and therefore the whole picture will move up. With lower sun, the whole picture will move down. And this is combined with the oceans, which you have seen in our process. Okay. So the story is the tiny carbon cycle does not drive the huge water cycle, but is piggybacking on it. Atmospheric carbon dioxide levels are the consequence of climate change, not its cause. Is there a support for observations? Yes. What you have here is the rain in the US, which is increasing uh, uh, through time over the last century. So is the solar activity increasing. But when you look at it, these are uh, the solar cycle, two and one year solar cycle. It starts from 1944. Every single time when you have a minimum, you have minimum precipitation and then primary productivity. Surely the rain doesn't drive the sun. Okay. If you want on geological time scale, well, you have the, uh, the ice cores and there the, uh, the uh, uh, first temperature changes, then century later CO2, okay. for the same reason. So, and that's nothing new. Something else, probably extraterrestrial, got the warming going. So we need another source of energy into the system and what could be the source which, which will drive the water cycle. So I think the actual system works like this. Sun with something else driving the water cycle. That water cycle generates climate. Climate tells us how much jungle and how much of water we will have, and then you have a feedback. Yes, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, yes. It does something, but essentially you can drive it from the top or from the bottom. And it is, this is understated, this is overstated. That's, uh, uh, the, the top is understated. And we'll, so what could it be? In my view, uh, the most likely ones is the, uh, is, uh, uh, the s s perhaps cosmic rays or whatever way, I don't have time to talk about it, but then you have the, the reflection is 77 watts per square meter, or the difference between uh, cloud, cloudy and cloudless sky is about 28 watts. So you change cloudiness by a few percent, you have that 1.6 watts. And you can do it. So you don't have to do it that way. So I think this is really, and actually I don't think this is an accident that those numbers are actually more or less equal. The energy comes in, makes this cycle, or drive the, the hydrological system and then goes down. Okay? And then, so, what is the alternative for energy for driving the water cycle? The, uh, there is an um, amplifier to total solar radiance, and perhaps cosmic rays and clouds, and that can easily account for the discrepancy of 1.6 meters. So I think this is probably the sequence, how it works, and uh, this is my presentation. Thank you very much.